Welcome to First Grapevine, a United Methodist Church. We're glad you have joined us for worship in person or online. Please take a moment and register your attendance by either filling out one of the registration cards or online through our church website, firstgrapevine.org, or our mobile app. Make plans now to observe Easter with First United Methodist Church of Grapevine. Join us Holy Thursday, April 6th at 6 p.m., for dinner in Founders Chapel, followed by a small group communion in other rooms on the campus. Remember the day that Jesus died for all of us during our Good Friday Tenebrae service at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary. Then come honor our risen Lord Jesus on Easter Sunday, April 9th. We will offer two outdoor services in the beautiful Grapevine Botanical Gardens just west of the church, a sunrise service at 7.30 in the morning, and a contemporary worship service at 11. Traditional worship with choir and orchestra will happen at both 8.30 and 11 a.m. in the sanctuary. I'm excited to invite you to our second annual Holy Week Organ Concert Series, April 3rd through 7th at 12 noon in the sanctuary. Our special guest artists will include Bradley Welch on Monday, Sonny Yu on Tuesday, Ken Surley on Wednesday, Scott Ayers on Thursday, and our own Linda Love and Ashley Winland on Friday. Come let these gifted, inspiring, and entertaining musicians enhance your Holy Week. What better way to celebrate Easter than with your church family here at First Grapevine?
Amen. Thank you, Linda, for that incredible piece. Uh, what a great way to kick off this week here on Palm Sunday is every day this week we'll be having a, an organ concert. If you saw the videos, you were coming in for about 30 minutes during lunch. You can come. If you need a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you let me know in advance and I will personally make it for you. We're going to have great music. We're going to have a great time. I hear you chuckle, but I am serious. So I hope to see you every day of the week. It is a joy to get to be here with you today on Palm Sunday as we celebrate Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem and his entry into our hearts and our lives. If you are a guest worshiping with us, whether you're in person, in the room, or through the, the magic of the internet, you are watching us from at home, we'd love for you to fill out the registration. Let us know that you're out there so that we can contact you and tell you more about our church and how you can get plugged in here. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for your blessings, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you for the gift of music today as we celebrate you coming into this world, into our lives, and into our hearts. We ask that you give us the strength to put aside all of our distractions, all of our worries, and all of our concerns, and just focus on you and the message that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. On this Palm Sunday, I invite you to stand as you are able. Get ready to wave your palms as the children process, and we sing our opening hymn, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. as our children's choir now sings.
Thank you, kids. That was beautiful. And soloists, great job on that. <laughs> what a blessed morning that we have had already. We sang about how the, the kids, when Jesus was entering Jerusalem, sang Hosanna. Then we got to hear the kids sing Hosanna. And I'm pretty sure uh, back there at that, that initial time that we had some kids wandering away from the group as a, as a whole, but they were just fine uh, as kids will be kids. What a blessing it is to have them participate in worship. This is the time in our worship service where we go to God collectively in prayer. We pray for one another. We pray for our church. We bless the offering and we say the Lord's Prayer together, and then we pass this morning's offering. Will you bow now with me for a moment of prayer? Gracious and holy God, thank you for this day and for this time now to be connected as a community of faith, seeking to worship and praise you this morning. We give you thanks for the abundance of blessings that surround us, and we pray that your Holy Spirit be among us now, connecting us to your holy and divine presence, speaking to us, and allowing us to hear your calling for our lives this morning. As we continue our Lenten journey this year with this Palm Sunday, let us have the courage to walk with your Son through Holy Week. Through today's triumphant entry into Jerusalem, all the way to the tribulations of the cross, may we use this time to seek a faith that impacts the world around us in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. May we be reminded of who you have called us to be in this world, people of grace and love, of justice and compassion. Give us the courage to be everything that you have called us to be. Holy God, you are our strength and our hope, and you know the heaviness we sometimes carry in our hearts. For those who are sick or hurting, for those battling disease or for those grieving, for those feeling lonely and for those in harm's way, we lift these up to you in the power of our prayer. And we pray for healing and protection and comfort. And we pray for the peace that passes all understanding that we know only you can provide. We pray for our church. And we ask your blessing be upon it and all of its people. And we pray for your continued guidance as we strive to be the community of believers that you have called us to be, transforming our faith into action, spreading your grace and compassion into this world. May your blessing be upon us as we seek to shine your love and your grace to all we encounter, both here in Grapevine and all over the world. Be present with us now, Lord, as we continue our worship. May the work that we do, the bounty that we share, and the kindness that we spread be acceptable in your sight. And as we give now of our tithes and offerings, we ask that you bless these gifts and pray that they be multiplied countless times over solely to your glory. May this sacrifice continue the mission of your Son, Jesus Christ, bringing the glory of your kingdom here on earth as we seek to be your hands and your feet in this world. And now, with the confidence of children, let us pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and lead us not to temptation. You trespassed against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power of and the glory forever. Amen.
to remain standing as we continue our worship with our hymn of preparation. This morning's hymn is one that's become a favorite of our church, Grace Alone. very few songs that reflect our feelings about grace uh, in the context of Christians that that song does. What a beautiful piece. Now I invite you to join me as we do this morning, speak together this morning's affirmation of faith. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. And all things be the conquerors to the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.
It's a word that often speaks of conditions in our lives that aren't good, times when things are missing, voids in our lives that need to be filled. However, during April, the month of Easter, as we look at the book of Matthew, we will discover that empty is the most beautiful word in the world. The empty tomb of Jesus Christ following his resurrection is a symbol of how the power of death was broken forever, and we have the hope of eternal life with God. In today's passage for Palm Sunday, we see the empty worship of some of the people when Jesus entered Jerusalem. They welcomed him with praises and palm branches. But later that same week, they would call for his crucifixion. It's a reminder how easily our hearts can turn away from Christ and how we should never lose sight of our Savior's empty tomb. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus gave two disciples a task. He said to them, Go into the village over there. As soon as you enter, you will find a donkey tied up and a colt with it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anybody says anything to you, say the Lord needs it. He sent them off right away. Now this happened to fulfill what the prophet said. Say to daughter Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the donkey's offspring. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had ordered them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on him. Then he sat on them. Now a large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others cut palm branches off the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds in front of him and behind him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. Who is this? They asked. The crowds answered, It's the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're beginning our, our series on the gospel of Matthew. We'll say a little bit more about that, but just in case you haven't heard, because I see some new faces, we are reading 12 books of the Bible this year, one for, uh, for each month. We intentionally did not pick the longest ones, so we're making this as easy as possible, but we are reading the scriptures, letting them work on us at the end of the year. If you read all of them, most of them, thought about reading them, opened your table of contents, whatever, the threshold is low, we will have a pizza party. Because why do we have to give up pizza parties for reading when we grow old? That seems unfair. So we are bringing that here to our church. I have a, a, just a couple of items of business before we dig into this story in Palm Sunday. One is you'll notice Carly Payne, Reverend Carly Payne is mentioned being in the bulletin. Reverend Carly Payne is not here today. Everything's okay. Do not panic. Uh, she, she got sick. She wanted to be here today. And I said, this week especially is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Stay home and rest. Now, I just wanted to mention that to you because I know you. And I know that when you see one of our names printed and then that individual is not here, your mind jumps to the worst possible scenario. Is Carly Payne in the hospital? Did Carly Payne get arrested? <laughs> I have no idea why you would think that. No, she is, she is fine. She is at home resting. I ordered her to stay, rest. We've got a lot of work to do this week. We've got a lot of fun things going on. You won't want to miss it, so just rest up. Wanted to say that. That's, that's number one. Number two is I need to break a rule of public speaking. I will share this rule with you, and I tell you, you would do well if you lived by this next time you need to address a crowd or a room or a group. If you are, say, not feeling well, maybe you're not as prepared as you should be, you're just not confident in your ability to present the material, do not tell the crowd that anything about that. You make them find that out on their own. All right, but uh, I have, and you can probably already hear it, I'm a little bit better right now, but I have what we call back home a frog in my throat, 
I'm just dealing with some allergies. I don't have a fever. I don't have COVID. I don't have any of that other stuff. Uh, and I'm just sharing that. I'm breaking that rule to share with you in case you'll notice. I'm going to have to go to the water cup more often than normal today. Uh, I didn't want you to panic and think I'm up here spewing a deadly disease upon all of you. I just live here in Texas where we are allergic to everything and everything is in the air. And uh, it's gotten the best of me this week. So if my voice goes out and I've got to cut it out earlier, you'll, you'll know why. And I'm sure some of you wonder, well, why don't you always do that? I get it. So this is, uh, this is Palm Sunday. This is the beginning of the Holy Week tradition as Jesus is entering into Jerusalem and as he's facing towards the cross. Uh, and the events seem so strange that we go from a triumphant celebration uh, to a murder. A lot happens in a matter of days in the story in the Bible. And there's a lot that we can learn from it and a lot we can gain. And I want to get into that before I do. I have a story I want to share, a silly fictional story. I'm a big fan of stand-up comedy. Some of you who have listened to me preach probably hear that and say, mm, that makes sense. One of, and I love all, all types, all, you know, all ages. I love the classic stuff. One of my all-time favorites is Mr. Jerry Clower. Some of you might be familiar. He's from Mississippi. Uh, he, he, he's passed away now. He's, he, he was popular decades ago. He tells stories about fictional people that, you know, if you're like me and you grew up in a small town, it seems kind of true, I assume. A lot of them are very, very real. But he tells a story of, again, these two made-up characters, and I believe I'm getting the, the names wrong, but, uh, but, but bear with me. There are these two country boys sitting out in front of the store one day, just wasting time chatting with each other, and uh, Udell says to Marcel, Marcel, you are my best friend in the whole wide world. I would do anything for you. I love you, Marcel. And Marcel says, you Dell, I love you too. You are my best friend in the world. I would do anything for you. I would. You Dell says to Marcel, Marcel, if you had two million dollars, would you give me one? Well, you Dell, you know if I had two million dollars that I would give you won. I love you. You mean so much to me. You are my best friend. And I would give you a million dollars if I had two million dollars. Marcel, if you had two hogs, would you give me one? Long pause. Now, you, Dale, that's not fair. You know I have two hogs. <laughs> this goes to show it's Nice to say flowery things and nice to say something, but a lot of times those words can be proven to be quite empty. That's what we find here in the story. As Jesus has been preaching, has been teaching, has been healing, the lame walk, the blind see, and the world is being changed with his message of hope, and they are saying about him that he is the one to come. The people of, of Israel at that time. You'll notice as we open up Matthew, it's the first of the four Gospels, we see that Rome is an occupying force in the world. They are, up to this point, the meanest, most efficient, most ruthless government the world has ever seen. And the people are suffering. And here, maybe, the Messiah, the one who is to bring freedom, maybe this is him, maybe he has come. That is who they believe that they are greeting as they go and as they gather and they crowd around the streets and they're waving palm branches and they're throwing their coats down and they're saying, Hosanna in the highest. Praise be to the one who has come from the line of David to set us free. They were right, but they were a little bit off. You see, as I said, they were looking for a political figure to come to, to fight off Rome, and what they got was not what they expected and not what they wanted, and they're a little bit disappointed. Now, first of all, to this image of Jesus riding in on a donkey into Jerusalem, we've got to keep in mind that we have to look at that through a filter, through a lens, because when you and I see somebody riding on a donkey, that seems a little silly. We think, is this a Don Quixote situation? Is he about to start tilting 
at windmills? Is he earnest from the country come to Jerusalem? No. The donkey is a, is a symbol of authority, of royalty, and of peace. Julius Caesar, when he declared himself emperor over all of Rome, he didn't ride back into Rome on a big war horse. He didn't ride into Rome in a really cool chariot. No, he actually parked his horse and his chariot outside of city limits and got on a donkey to ride into Rome. And so Jesus, as he's coming in, is showing who he is, that he is the prince of peace, that he is the son of God, that he truly is is the Messiah. The part of the mix-up is right there in the instrument that he chose to ride. Because as the people were gathering, waving their palm branches, throwing their coats down, they didn't want him to come in on a donkey. Because a donkey is what you ride when you are coming in and you already reign and you are already the king of the city. No, they wanted Jesus to ride in on a big horse to be carrying a sword to come in as a conquering political figure, not as one who brings peace. He was really clear with who he was. He was really clear about what he wanted to do. But those hosannas, those waving palm branches, those coats thrown down on the ground, those were empty words. Those were empty gestures. Because you see, and you'll notice as the timeline happens very quickly, there is a plot to arrest Jesus and to have him killed. In fact, they reach a point where the Romans have to say, look, due to this being the Passover, we have a tradition here. We will release a prisoner to you. We will set him free. Who do you want? Do you want Jesus of Nazareth? No. Give us the other guy. Give us Barabbas. We know he will fight. Within a matter of days, empty words as they turned on Jesus and they asked for something else. See, those are hollow, empty words. That is a, a theme of the Gospel of Matthew, as I mentioned. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the reason there are four different Gospels is that they tell the story of Jesus, of his life and his ministry, of his death and his resurrection, from four different perspectives. That'd be like if four of us who knew the same person stood up at that person's memorial service and then told about her or him, we would each say different things because we have a different perspective on that individual. Or if there are four witnesses to a car wreck, they'll tell it four different ways and to different people, different audiences. And Matthew is writing and speaking directly to a Jewish audience, and he's making the point over and over and over again, this is the one to come. Jesus is the Messiah. And he connects directly to the Old Testament. Now, the reason we're reading this in this order, we just read the book of Exodus. Exodus tells the story of God calling the people of Israel out of slavery and bondage in Egypt into a new life, into relationship with him. It tells the story of God calling Moses to go and to lead the people out. And this is who they are. As I mentioned, Matthew's the first of the Gospels. The reason for that is that the one that connects the most with the Old Testament, that's why it's right there. Did you know that? Come to church and learn something. Isn't that great? Now, the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, warned against things like this, warned against days like that with big gestures, big signs, but ultimately hollow words. Malachi writes, and I'm paraphrasing, if all we're going to do is put on a show and our words are just hollow and our faith really means nothing to us in our hearts and we don't want to live it, not only when it's easy, but also when it's hard, then why don't we just go ahead and close the doors to the temple anyway? Let's just shut down this whole operation if it's just a bunch of empty words and gestures. And Matthew even writes that Jesus said, there's some who are going to say, Lord, Lord. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God because their faith doesn't mean anything and they didn't do the word of God. And so Jesus calls us and the people who were there that day are called not just to wave palm branches when we think we've got someone who's going to come and solve our problems the way we want, but to live faithfully and to seek God even when it's hard 
Even when we're called to places that make us uncomfortable, even when things don't go the way that we want them to go. Let me be clear, though. I am not saying that our faith, our relationship with God, our eternal salvation is based on our works and our behavior at all. And I thank God for that. You've heard me say, and it's true, I meet a lot of people who are new to church or they're thinking about coming to church, and they meet me and they say, you're a pastor? Really? And uh, I always assume it's due to the lack of a haircut, but I don't ask too many follow-up questions about what they think I ought to look like and how they think I ought to talk. But they say, and I hear this a lot, I'm a little bit more prepared now, they say, I'm afraid if I walk through those doors, I will catch on fire. And I let them know that's not how it works. If it did, I would have been fricasseed many times over. I go there every day. Hadn't burned up once. And if that's the standard, I probably would. You've heard me say before, uh, we hear the criticism about church. The church, I don't want to go because it's just full of hypocrites. And I tell them, that's just not true. We've got room for many more. So many more. We have a really big sanctuary. We stand up and sing that song, Grace Alone, because it is by the grace of God that we go. It is by the grace of God that we do anything good at all in our lives, and it's that grace that we lean on, not our own behavior, not the things that we do, but we are just called to try to respond faithfully. Now, again, as Matthew is making clear to his Jewish audience that they understand who Jesus is, he mentions here the line of David. David was the first king in this line that is a name that is still recognized today. You'll go to Jerusalem and you'll see David's name everywhere. There are lots of streets named after him to this day. Now, this is God's king, kingly line here. David was not the first king of Israel. There was another king before him named Saul, and he was not faithful to God. And so God said to him, you know what? I'm going to go in a different direction. Your son will not become king. I'm going to go with this David figure over here. Now, if you're to go back and you're to read that story and you're to read about Saul and David, and you're going to try to contrast their lives, you're going to notice David is a bit more of a scoundrel than Saul was. When it comes to getting in trouble, David just goes full Yahtzee the whole time. In fact, his resume of bad behavior is, shall we say, biblical. And yet, this is the line that God chose to bless and for his son to come out of this line. And you ask yourself, why is that? Why David and not Saul? Well, Saul, whenever he did wrong, he didn't humble himself. He didn't turn back to God. He made excuses, made arguments. He thought he knew best. Every time David does wrong and he realizes what he has done, it's where someone challenges him or he feels it in his heart, he repents, he apologizes, and he does his best to respond in faith. That is the difference, is the response in faith. As I mentioned, we just read the book of Exodus that tells the story of these people freed by God from slavery. You would think that they would be so grateful and they would mind their P's and Q's, but no. As soon as they had a break, they made a golden calf and threw a party. And that was just one of many times that they knew what to do and they went a different way and they made mistakes over and over and over again. And yeah, Moses got angry and yes, there were consequences, but ultimately God forgives and God continues to call them back. In fact, God didn't call them in the first place because they were good. God called them to do good things through them. And that is the grace that was offered to them. It's a grace we still lean on today. Now, you hear me pick on those people and and accuse them as they were waving palm branches back then of having a hollow gesture and hollow words. But the same grace that I depend on, I know, was offered to them as well. And that is the good news that we celebrate, that each and, one of, each and every one of us goes with, is that God calls out to us, and what are we supposed to do? That is respond faithfully. Doesn't mean we have to get everything right, but our words need to be true and not ring hollow 
as we do our best to make the decision today, I'm going to respond in faith today. I'm going to seek God today. Might not get it all right, but I'm going to try. And that was what God is calling us to do. And that is why Jesus came, walked amongst us, taught, healed, loved, and ultimately died so that we could have that grace offered to us. And so how do we respond faithfully to this? Part of it is pretty easy. It's to show up. Right after Jesus died, he was resurrected. He met with Peter. Peter was one who had a bunch of hollow words too. He said, oh, I'll never betray you. I'll never turn on you. I'll be there with you every step of the way. And as soon as things got hot, what did he do? He denied that he ever even knew Jesus. He goes, no, you can't tell by my accent that I'm from the sticks too. No, never knew the guy, never knew him. Even after he did that, Jesus met with him. And what does he say to him? He doesn't say, I got you, now you're going to burn. No. He says, Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. He says to the rest of the disciples before he ascends into heaven, he says to them, he doesn't say, go and try to get everything right and be really particular and make sure no one sits in your pew ever. He doesn't say that. He says, go and make disciples. And the way that Jesus did that when he walked amongst us was he spent time with them loved them, shared his knowledge, he encouraged them, challenged them, and he was there with them. And that's what each and every one of us is called to do as well, to show up for those that we love when they're grieving, when they're sad, to encourage, to show up here, to meet new people, to dare to talk to someone that I'm sure we might have met at some point, but I don't remember your name, talk anyway, to invite those who are friends and our family to come and to be blessed here at our church. We've got the organ concert series this week, and yes, we've talked about it a lot, and it's not just because we like it and we want to do something fun and my office has an organ and I want it to be played while I'm eating my lunch. No, we're doing this because music soothes the soul. People need that. And if you know of someone in your life who could be blessed, then bring them encourage them, introduce them, let them be here and let them hear music and just have a break for a minute. I got a call this week, one of those tough ones. Someone who was in our church had passed away suddenly. I fear I get too many of those these days. It's hard. It doesn't get any easier. But yet, it gives me a chance to see something joyful and to see the true purpose of what we do. I was speaking to a grieving person who just lost a spouse. And he says to me, I don't think I'm gonna be able to come to church this week. And I said, that is A-okay. Church is gonna come to you. Clearly the Spirit of God was with me. Spirit of Grant is not that clever. But I heard those words come out of my mouth and I thought, isn't that really what this is about? Isn't that really how we show that when we stand up, when we sing hymns, these are not empty words. We show that by going and being present with people who have experienced loss, who are grieving, who don't know where to put the very next foot. As I was talking to the choir before worship started, because we gather, we, we pray, we center ourselves on what we have to do, I gestured to the empty pews and I said, we have no idea what all pains and worries and concerns are out there. Because what we do when we lead worship, when we teach, when we share, it really, it really matters. It is really important. And so, if you are here in this room and you're hearing the story of Jesus triumphantly walking into Jerusalem and you're hearing us talk about this grace and you want to know more about it and you want to know how it feels in your heart, we want to pray with you. We want to share this good news with you because we know it will change your life. And the challenge for all of us is to remember and not let our words ring hollow as we say that we're faithful people, as we stand up and as we sing. It's ours to take it and go out there and to live it. One of my favorite things happened in service just a few minutes ago. Jason messed up the Lord's Prayer. I love it when that happens. Welcome to the club, my friend, by the way. 
Oh, I messed up the 23rd Psalm, my rookie season. I thought I was just going to have to melt underneath the pulpit right there. But what I love what happened uh, when Jason bumbled the line, which is, by the way, why you will always catch me reading it. You could string me up in the middle of the night by my toes, and I could tell you the 23rd Psalm, the Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer, but for some reason you get up here under the hot lights, and those words just seem to disappear. But did you notice what happened? You got a little bit louder. Did you notice that the choir said it a little bit more clearly? And whenever there's a falter, whenever there's a pause, those words just come out and move out of us. The reason that we stand up and we say our, the affirmation of faith and the reason that we say the Lord's Prayer over and over again is so it will be so written on our hearts that we'll be able to say it and know it when we need it most in those darkest moments. The reason that we say the creeds and that we have them is to teach new people about our faith. We stand up and we say it with them as they're new to the church so they can know more about God and how God loves them. As I said, I love that that happened here. But everything that we do here is to prepare us to go out there. And I hope that as you go, as you travel this week and every week, that those words will just well up in you when that needs to be said, when the, whenever someone needs a word of encouragement, when they need to know about your faith. I pray that you, those words ring true out of your mouth. In Jesus' name we pray. Or, I'm sorry, let's pray in the name of Jesus. Now I goofed up. I shouldn't have picked on him like that, should I? Wow, instant, instantly. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for your presence here amongst us. We thank you for your grace, your words, your comfort, and laughter. We ask that you fill us with your spirit, Lord, so that when the when time is right, that our words will ring true and we will speak of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. A few days after that entry, Jesus took his disciples to a room to share the Passover meal with them. He took the bread that was on the table. He broke it, gave thanks to God, and said, this is my body which is given for you. He took the cup, blessed it, gave thanks to God, and said, this is the blood of the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Do this when you gather in remembrance of me. In these very normal, traditional elements of the table, Christ was extending to his disciples grace, and forgiveness, and hope. And Christ is still reaching out to each and every one of us today. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask that you pour out your spirit on these gifts of bread and of the cup. Let them be for us, the body and blood of Christ, so that when we go out these doors, we will be the body of Christ for a world that is in need. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna ask those who are helping serve to please come forward. And as they do, I'll give a couple of points of instruction. If you need a gluten-free alternative, those are available at the end of the aisles on a little table right there. Now, we have, off, we have the altar rail that is open. We offer this to you as a time of prayer. You can come up here and pray. If you are physically unable to come forward, you can come on up here, Angela. Don't be shy. Come on up here. Uh, don't be scared of my waving arms. If you are physically unable to come forward, you just give us a little wave and we will come and serve you right where you are. Now, if you're a guest, we want to be sure you know that this is not, a, this is not First Grapevine's table. This is God's table. And all who seek God are welcome here. We don't care if you are a member or not. We're going to serve them first and then the ushers will, will guide you forward.
you pray with me? Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for this meal of the bread and the juice. We pray they be for us nourishment, mind, body, and soul, so that we may follow in the footsteps of your Son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the time in our service that we call the invitation to Christian discipleship. What that means for me is what are the ways that we can develop our faith together in community, and also what are the ways that we can take that out into the world. Of course, this week, as Grant has mentioned, we've got multiple opportunities for you to do just that during this Holy Week. I wanted to highlight two of our special services that are coming up. Our first one is Thursday, Holy Thursday at 6 o'clock. This is an interactive experience where some of our classrooms in the upstairs of the FLC will be transformed into upper rooms, and you will take communion with just a small group of people, much as the disciples did long ago. And as you heard, the choir is pretty much on fire this week. They're so committed to their calling to, to lead us in music through the stories of our faith. And on Good Friday, we will have a music-led service with congregational hymns and anthems, and we will walk through the story uh, at 7 p.m. of Jesus' path to the cross. It'll be a powerful experience, and I invite you to come to that and bring a friend if you need to experience and hear that story once again. As we close our service, we're running a little late on our time, so we're just going to sing one verse of Because He Lives, and I invite you to stand as we do that together. It is a joy to get to be here with you today. Thank you. What a, what a, it's great to have a full church and have a long line up to communion, and we thank God for that. I hope you have a great week, and I hope I get to see you. Go in peace.